Welcome to the podcast of the impossible. I'm Peter Wood, and my guest today is Baltimore magician and Ohio expat Joel DeWire. Here we go. Hello. Gotta let that play out. Joel, thank you for uh, for being here. Uh, no ever described me as an Ohio expat. I, I was trying to come up with what, what how we could how we could get into this, right? Um, yeah. yeah. So. Yeah, so I, I I know parts. You found like magic tricks in a trunk as a kid or something. What what was the you found something right? Yeah, so I think every time somebody asks me, you know, where it all started, my, my story's probably been slightly different over the years. Cool. Because I remember different parts of it. I just don't remember the order. Yeah, so um, my brother and I uh, were snooping in our storage room in the basement of our house when I was probably six or seven. That's uh, as right. Young kids are do. Yeah, and um. I came across this um, cardboard brown Hoover vacuum box okay. uh, and curiosity got the best of me and I opened it and I saw inside a bunch of, you know, what we would call apparatus. Mm -hmm. um, I, I still don't know how to describe it to people. I knew what it was, even though I didn't know what it was. Okay. And around that time too, my dad had recorded um, a segment from the tonight show with Johnny Carson uh, where Joseph Gabriel, a very young Joseph Gabriel, uh, had been on the show doing his bird and dove act. And my dad recorded me. He said, hey, you know, it was one Saturday morning or whatever. He he said, I think I, I have something you're going to like. Hmm. And so he played. And I, uh, I was mesmerized by that bird act. And I probably must have watched it hundreds of times. Right. The right. funny thing about that particular story is several months ago, that video, that clip, was a recommended video on my YouTube account. And I'm like, God, that looks familiar. What is that? And I watched the video and that it was the video that I had right. seen when I was a kid and it gave me a really good laugh. That's crazy. So, I mean, like, you know, that's cool. That's sort of how it started. Sure. But so do you think, I'm just curious about the timing of your dad recording this thing off a of TV happening around the same time as, as you guys stumbling upon this old stuff. Like, is, do, do you think he had any sense of what, of that? Or was it literally just coincidence? He, yeah, he must've, I mean, I must've said something to him about what I saw in the storage room and then he, right. you know, probably started to do some of that. And it wasn't, it was somewhere around that time too. My sister had just randomly without, without asking, brought home a book um, from the Delphus library where I grew up, Delphus, Ohio. Mm. Um, and it was the Mickey Mouse book of magic, which I know, you know, a little something about that's still in uh, I've got a copy. Impossible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my first magic show done purely from tricks in that book. So it was pretty lame, but okay. um, it was a good, a good starting point. And from there, I just, I got sucked into the library because, you know, we didn't have the internet back when I was a kid learning magic. And so we learned from library books and I, I'm certain I checked out every book in the Delphus Public Library on Magic sure, easily. Sure. Seven. Or yeah, no, I definitely. Uh, I mean, that was we're we're from the library age for sure. You know. Yeah. Um, I miss it. I still miss it. Yeah. Well, I I wonder what what makes it because libraries don't have that kind of a collection anymore. Mm -hmm, like Delphus, mm -hmm. as it was, had had a really good extensive collection on sleight of hand magic, card mm -hmm, magic, mm -hmm. um, history of magic. But I, you know, walk into any public library now in Baltimore County, where I live, or Howard County, mm -hmm. and I'd be very surprised if you saw more than a couple of books in there. You know, they're probably more contemporary, like Joshua J's Book of Magic or something like that. But you don't have any right. of the great stuff that I had, Walter Gibson and some of those other classics. Yeah, no, I think. I mean, I don't, I don't want to sound like a bunch of old guys sitting around talking about, <laughs> but, but it, there, but it we is, are. yeah, well, at least what I, what I at least appreciate about uh, Joshua Jay's uh, small tangent here is that like, it's thicker. <laughs> uh, the, the uh, when I, when I visit libraries now and I look at books that are there, a lot of them are very thin, very yeah. glossy, like, like here are 10 things you can do. And I guess, you know, if if you were a kid and you stumbled upon the Mark Wilson complete course or the amateur magician's handbook or or any of the Walter Gibson stuff, like it just gave you a lot in one volume as opposed to here are the twelve yeah. tricks you can learn. You know, Mark Wilson's course and that complete course of magic is the I Ching baby. I mean, that, yeah. I, I would st I would still recommend that to anyone who wants to get into magic. Yeah, I think one, and I'm trying to figure out, so there was a copy of Tarbell one in my middle school hmm. library wow. and 
And even then, though, I remember thinking like, this is, but by the time I was in middle school, I was into this enough that I could sort of read this academically. Um, sure. I, it, 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 I don't think it had any business being in a middle school library because <laughs> if you weren't already interested in this, then this just seems like some old outdated book from the fifties where a guy talks about, you know, his, his travels to the Orient, you know, and, and that's, that's mm-hmm. how you're supposed to set up this, you know, routine or whatever. And so even as a, as a, uh, a, a teen, uh, you know, a young preteen, I guess I was like, this is an outdated book. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad I found it. So, you know, yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm curious about, uh, we have been to a lot of magic shows together. Uh, yeah. and I know that, I mean, you and I both enjoy just going and watching magic as well. So and I'm, I'm so kind of curious. I've never actually asked you about like, what, what, what's your like top three, top five, like even of all time, like something you saw as a kid or, or, you know, as a young person. Um, and I'm also, I'm, I bet you that some of ours are going to be the same or overlapping, but I'm just curious where you, uh, where you go when I ask that, you know? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I, for my entire life, I've struggled with name your top five movies, name your top five books. It's sure. so hard. Yeah, yeah. Um, but this is this is a little bit easier. I'll, I'll name the um, most influential magicians that I think have shaped my character as a performer, which I'm sure you will agree with after you hear my list. Sure. Um, I grew up on a steady diet of David Copperfield specials on ABC, uh, mm-hmm. and so for much of I saw him for the first time when I was in third grade at the okay. Lima Civic Center in Lima, Ohio which was like living a dream. I mean, like he's, yeah. he walks down the aisle where you're sitting and you're just like, I can't possibly be true. <laughs> like, sure, sure. It was, I, I still remember it very vividly. It was very cool. Um, but you know, like David is at a completely different level. I, you know, I, I really had never had aspirations to do like illusions. And so I, I very quickly started to um, uh, become attracted to the close up performers. Mm-hmm. The real skill missions of, you know, sitting at a table with an intimate group of people. So, you know, Michael Vincent today is probably and has been for a number of years now, um, one of my uh, top, top magicians, not only because does he have a, an encyclopedic knowledge of the history of magic and some of the great performers from the golden era mm-hmm. when he was, um, he's like three or four time British close up champion, right. <laughs> like over three right. different Gates too, like so. Um, having had the chance to meet him on a, on a visit to Baltimore um, when he was giving a lecture was another formative experience and a really cool experience for me. Um, his 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 storytelling in particular. I mean, he he bar bar none. I mean, he's he is top notch close up mm-hmm. magician in terms of mechanics in terms of um, just performing the sleight of hand. But his how he incorporates other interests in his life and things he reads about or experiences or discovers, how he weaves a story to kind of hook the audience and bring them into the moment beyond just the trick they're about to see, is uh, always and sort of inspired me to make my act or my performances about something more than, hey, look, I, I know something you don't know, or I can do something you can't do. Sure. Uh, so he's been very formative. Um, but uh, back to when I was younger, um, Michael Amar was, was, is it Amar? Amar. I think it's Amar. Amar. I'm, I'm, sure, Michael, yeah, I'm sure it's half Michael, half. when you see this episode. <clears throat> yeah. It's just like I Dave know, Vernon. I, I, he came and lectured at my local uh, IBM ring in a lineup oh, cool. when I was a kid. Oh, wow. Okay. And so, you know, I was on a steady diet of a lot of his stuff, card on ceiling, crazy man's handcuffs, floating bill. I did all that stuff for a, mm-hmm. for a lot of years when I was younger and still do some of it today. Um, so yeah, I would, I would say certainly those two, Brendan Rodriguez, I think is, is another British magician, um, hmm. like who, who makes you like, if, if you're a close up magician, if you're a knuckle buster kind of slide of hand performer, he makes you want to quit magic. Cause he's that good. Like if, if, <laughs> yeah, if, you're, yeah. if you have the time listeners, like go look up Brendan Rodriguez, magician, uh-huh. his queen will, will just make your mind grind to a halt. It is one of the <laughs> coolest things. You will ever, and he, I think he has a background as a, like a flair bartender with the bottles and the flipping and the tossing. And so he's gotcha. really good with like uh, finger dexterity and, and doing uh, simultaneous things with both hands, which, you okay. know, basically doubles or 10 X's his impact on the side of hand because he can do things simultaneous, different things with both hands at the same time. Wow. It's so yeah, yeah, fun, yeah. To watch. fun to watch. 
Well, what about what about you? I mean, any overlap in that that list with you? Uh, I mean, yeah, I where I watched Brandon Rodriguez when I was a kid growing up. You yeah. know, uh, every year his special would come. No, I've never heard. I'm, I I need to look up Brandon Rodriguez now. I'm glad I, I've got a, I've got a new name. That's exciting. Um, no, I mean definitely Copperfield for sure. I mean, but Absolutely. but it's uh, uh, you. I, I almost feel bad. But it, it, I'm I appreciate how diverse the landscape is now, and oh, folks yeah. have to remember that like. In the late '80s and early '90s, it was Copperfield because you it 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 was a television event, and uh, even when we started to get into the Gary Ouellet, World's Greatest Magic, you know all those things, it was wonderful that that provided more variety. But Copperfield specials were still happening at the same time, so. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I remember going and seeing him at the Cavernous Patriot Center in Virginia um, and literally bringing binoculars, you know, um, and uh, but it was still cool. Like, here's a guy that I've seen on TV and now I'm, I'm in the room with him like that, that that experience. He definitely was smart about the one. I mean, and Penn and Teller talk about this, too, where one is that you're you, everything is is going toward the, your live show. So so even the TV sh- special is basically a commercial for that, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, so it's, it, that was definitely, c- certainly, certainly him. Uh, I'm interested with Michael Lamar, um, <laughs> because I feel like, a, so you saw him live for, for, for mm-hmm. our listener, um, who may not be familiar with Michael Lamar. I feel mm-hmm. like, a, so he is a magician who is well known for a whole series in particular, mm-hmm. a, a series of, uh, videos, right. Called easy to master, whatever, whatever the specific mm-hmm. subject is. But basically, uh, he was a big part of a lot of young magicians growing up at the very beginnings of sort of the VHS era. I want to say where he had, <laughs> he has books out. I don't, I don't mean to say mm-hmm. that he was only video, but I guess a lot of folks that I know were sort of introduced to him because they got a VHS tape of his, of his material. But did, so you saw him live before that? Yeah. So I think there's easy to master card and coin miracles and stuff Mm -hmm. that came out, I think after, cause I I was only probably, uh, I mean, I definitely didn't have a car. I was probably like 11 or 12, maybe 13, um, when he came to Lida. So, um, even he was a bit, uh, you know, uh, younger, but he had the classic rendition stuff like the, those, videos, oh, yeah. Ser- yeah. you know, series that he's trying to do some uh, innovative teaching. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So, I mean, but he did a lot of his classic stuff um, that, that, that later came out in a lot of those videos or, or the stuff that he was included in the world's greatest magic VHS and later DVD series. Right. Um, uh, I remember that, but uh, I mean, it, it was cool because he gave a lecture, but then like at a part of it, it was a workshop. Like he would literally sit down with small groups mm. who wanted to talk and work on things. And, and he would do that with you. Uh, right. What, it was cool. I idolized him for a number of years. Um, yeah. yeah. For his close up. Yeah. No, that's cool. That's, uh, that's neat. And, and I mean, it's always better to, to be introduced to someone live like that. I mean, to, to have the op- opportunity to, to be in the room with them as opposed to just from, from a uh, TV or, or a video or something like that. Now, quick, quick anecdote too. You and I have never had the chance to see Copperfield together. We have seen right. the other great performers. Brown. Yeah. But so I, so in 2019, uh, remember I flew out to Las Vegas mm-hmm. for 24 hours with the sole goal of just going to see Copperfield. Cause it had been 17 years since I had last seen his show. Wow. Yeah. Which yeah. An incredibly long time. And I, I figured, you know, at some point he is going to like, you know, hang up the magic hat and retire to some degree. Mm-hmm. And like, if I, if I miss that opportunity to see his stage show one more time, I'm just going to always regret it. And I, I will tell you like, um, you know, he is, a, he is a different man now in some ways, but his act, his show will still absolutely crush you. Like, yeah. Yeah. I will not give anything away. Like it is, it is very much worth going to see some of the stuff that happens in the second half of the show. will just, I mean, I still, I don't know. And I don't want to know how it works. uh, Yeah, no, I mean, I agree. And and, I mean, the word that I keep, I always sort of come back to is cinematic, uh, for, and, and my, my only, uh, you know, I'm, I'm yes. Anding here, like a hundred percent agree, but just for an interesting conversation, devil's advocate kind Mm -hmm. of a thing. Uh, the, the only, 
I, I worry sometimes that an audience will just say, oh, well, that's all just technology and special effects. And, and you know, the, technically what we do is special effects just live, right? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And obviously a, 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 an audience knows that David Copperfield is not using computer graphics to achieve what he's achieving. Uh, but there is something about, you know, like you said, some of the newer things that he's created are really all about how much can I bring a movie like experience into um, a theater. And, mm -hmm. and I almost wonder if it kind of sort of like how in and of itself was, you know, you could either say it was a really bad magic show because the guy only did like five tricks the whole time, you know? So if you want to frame it as just a magic show, then you may be disappointed by that. But if you are looking at it as a piece of theater that also had some really mind blowing parts. And so I kind of wonder if Copperfield, like I, I, I have heard from folks who work with him. So he, he, it is, it is no industry secret that he uses a lot of uh, plants, stooges, confederates, people who are working for him, who are in the crowd, who help the show mm -hmm. to progress in a certain way. And mm -hmm. he has said that he is fine with people, the audience, knowing that because it is a, it's supposed to be a theatrical experience. So just like when Cirque gets somebody out of the crowd and all of a sudden something crazy happens and it turns out that they're part of the troop, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, I guess, uh, Copperfield is sort of okay with, he's thinking in those terms as well. Like, well, it's okay if, if people realize that some of these members of the audience were actually on my team. I don't know how I feel about that. I'm, and I'm curious what your thoughts are in terms of like, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I love the argument that magicians get into, like, and we even with like uh, lay people and spectators, like this idea of it doesn't count if, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I think what you said is really, really interesting, which is, you know, essentially what we do as magicians a lot of times is we are creating moments with special effects. We're just doing it live. Why does right. it matter? You know uh how it's accomplished you don't criticize the movie avatar for being too much cgi like right, it's the right. story that matters right and so i think um i'm not a i think i come out as a purist on the stooge thing um, only because i think if 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 we welcome that that possibility it's too easy to, to lean into it as an explanation for everything and i think that mm. lessens the moment and to me the moment is what matters yeah you know, closing as many doors as possible um, as we're trying to create really genuine, authentic, magical moments. Again, like it shouldn't matter to anyone if I'm using, you know, a cable to levitate something. Sure, the, sure. the point is you have this magic moment when you didn't expect something to levitate right in front of your eyes um, or right. fly above your head or maybe. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, that feels a little dirty to me. I just personal preference. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, it, it, I, I think in particular he was talking about like, you know, he gets someone out of, you know, so-and-so's sister died before she was able to come see my show, but her brother is here tonight. And so I'm going to do an illusion <laughs> with him. Right. Yeah. And, and <laughs> a lot of magicians will watch that and go, what? This is, a, no one, no one buys this. And, yeah. but, but I think, but what David has said is that like, well, that's okay. I mean, th like th that's not, yeah. he, he is trying to, to tell a story with an emotional yeah. hook and he is okay with somebody saying that guy is in on it and he's, and he works for David and he's here three times a week, you know? Um, yeah. but I, I do, sure. I, it, it does make it sort of fuzzy then when anytime you like, I, th I think all of that is completely fine until you start doing um, mentalism or mind reading type stuff. Yes. Anytime, if, if he's doing a routine where he's going to predict something on license plates and he's okay with you knowing that people in the audience are actually actors who work for him. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think there's a conflict there. If he was just doing visual stuff, if it was just beautiful, crazy things flying around and appearing and disappearing, then I, I think somehow that can play by different rules, you know? Um, yeah, but anyway. I think the magic moment for him is is so impactful that you just you, you sort of over oversee or look past the 
you know, the sister never got a chance to see my show, but her brother's here. Well, when they disappear in the middle of the audience, three yeah. feet from where you're sitting and later reappear on stage, you kind of forget how cheesy the storyline was. And like, how the F did that happen? Yeah, 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. No, and I, hopefully it doesn't lessen. Uh, I, I've yet to find somebody who, who, who says that that is the part that they liked, you know, like mm. I, I, I kind of wish that there was that. I, I wish we could run the experiment, the AB experiment, where he just says, all right, now here's this guy. Uh, he works for me. This is Bill. Uh, we're going to do something cool with Bill. And then the music swells and then Bill disappears and reappears <laughs> on the stage, you know? I'll call Wouldn't, David and see if he does it. He'll do it. Okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll, let me text him right now. Um, yeah. Don't, don't, I mean, uh, I... I, I feel like what most people, what, what the takeaway for most people is, is still that was crazy. That guy disappeared from here and reappeared over there. And, and I, so I, I just, again, I wish, I wish that David would do that AB testing where one show I'm going to take out all of the emotional hooks <laughs> and just do, and just do, uh, honestly, more like Penn, like Penn and Teller have almost no emotional hooks, right? They have ideas, yeah. but they don't have, for my next trick. Uh, right. Yeah. We just, uh, now we're going to do this thing, you know, and look, there's a, there's yeah. just your, your cell phone is inside a fish. That was cool. You know, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that that's cool. the punchline. Not Dude, let's figure out that trick. Yeah. Well, you get a when, phone call when the, when, while it's inside the fish. When I was when I was little, uh, I dropped my cell phone while fishing, and this fish came and it it swallowed it whole. And so all my life, I've been dreaming about finding this fish. And tonight, we're going to make my dream a reality. So, yeah, um, fish has never seen snow. This is the last time. This is not the last time that we're gonna we're gonna have you on here. But we're gonna wrap this one up. Um, uh, so I want to let sure uh, for anyone watching the video version of this, uh, we've got it uh, under the screen here the whole time. But Joel Dewire Magic dot com. That's J O E L D E W Y E R Magic dot com. That's where folks can uh, find more about you all around, uh, mostly around the Baltimore area, sort of where the area where I'm based out of as well. Um, and for uh, I think that's it for this episode for my public shows and social media and special projects you can head on over to of the impossible.com that's joel dewire i'm peter wood thanks Cheerio.